There we go, Elise. Matthew chapter 28. We are thankful for the theme that has emerged from uh, the singing this morning, just an attitude of praise and thanksgiving, and how we appreciate that. Matthew 28, uh, beginning in... Uh, Beginning in verse, what did I tell you, Elise? I don't even remember what I told you now. <laughs> verse 6, amen. Stand with us in reverence and honor to the reading of God's Word. We need to do that song, girls. Uh, what's the stand up, sit down song? What's the name of that? You remember what I'm talking about? You have no clue. You're looking at me like I'm dumb. Anyway, we've got a stand-up, sit-down song where we can wake you up. And uh, they don't know what it is, and I don't either, so maybe there's not such a song. I might have, I might have dreamed that last night, as far as I know. But uh, anyway, Matthew uh, chapter 28. Our, uh, our mind has still really been on the resurrection. And, uh, and really, for the believer, that's the way it ought to be every day. It, it ought to be that. Tr truthfully, <clears throat> as we drive... Through the countryside and around the south, we see churches uh, generally about every two miles because that's about how far people could walk uh, years ago before the automobile. So they put a church up about every two miles. But on top of all of those churches, there's a steeple, and on top of that steeple, most of the time, there's a cross. So oftentimes, inside of the church, part of the sanctuary decor is a cross somewhere on the stage up here or maybe on the wall, uh, something of the sort. Uh, and again, I'm not taking away from the cross at all. It's, it's needed, it's necessary, and it was vital. But the truth of the matter is the cross is not the symbol or sign of Christianity. The empty tomb is the symbol of Christianity. The fact that we serve a risen Savior. And so that is so significant in the life of the believer, it should be significant in the life of a believer, that I believe... Uh, that there are many who are still yet walking in darkness or many walking in defeat when if you really had a meeting with the resurrected Savior, things would be different in your life. You've got to know and understand that He is alive. And so that's why I want to preach on living uh, the resurrected life. Uh, and we're going to approach this just a little bit different today, but let's look at the Scripture, if you will. The Bible in Matthew 28, verse 5 says this, says, And the angel answered and said unto the woman, remember the women, women who went to the tomb uh, there at the, at the breaking of day, and they met an angel by the tomb, and the angel said this, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. Uh, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, uh, I have told you. And so the women went to the tomb to prepare the body of Jesus. They get there. The angel's there. He says, he's not here. He is risen. Come and see for yourself the place where they have laid him. Uh, and in fact... He left a message for you to go on to Gal that he's gone on to Galilee, that if you'll go to Galilee there, you will meet him there. You may be seated. May God add the blessing to the reading of his word. I'm, uh, I'm, I may, I may pr approach church philosophy diff a little different than uh, your modern emerging church today, and maybe I'm approaching it different than what they may be teaching in some of our seminaries today. But I believe when we gather as a church, I believe that uh, so often times the ranks of our pews are filled up with people who are hurting, uh, people who have need in their life, people who are struggling just to live day to day with various struggles going on within them, uh, people who have sin struggles, people who have battles with uh, depression or anxiety, uh, people who have prodigals in their life, prodigal sons or daughters, uh, people who maybe themselves are a prodigal son. Uh, or a prodigal daughter. Uh, and so I believe as we gather together, though we're dressed up and smiling, uh, and uh, indeed I pray that, that behind that smile is truth, that you're walking in victory today in every area of your life. Uh, but uh, So while I believe that, that many come and they have need in their life, I, it simply brings me to believe that as we sing and preach and teach, that we need to be reminded that the church, we are a hospital for the sick. 
Uh, we're not a gathering place for the perfect. Uh, and so I'm not going to stand and preach every Sunday like all is well in your life, like you'll never have any heartaches. Uh, you'll never have cancer. You'll never have financial struggles. Uh, you'll wake up in the morning. Your hair won't be messed up. You'll have no bad breath. You'll get Kool-Aid out of your water fountain and, and the day will always be sunshine uh, and that there'll always be a rose garden for you to walk in. I'm not going to treat life such as that because I live the same life you do. And I know life is not all about that. I like those days, don't get me wrong. Uh, I like days where it seems like even when it's storming outside, the sun's still shining inside my heart. Uh, I enjoy days like that. I'm thankful for days of walking in victory and having no need, but I want you to understand uh, that, that those days of struggle, those days of burden, uh, those days uh, of need in our life, one thing it does is it makes me weak, and the Bible says when I am weak, then he is strong. And so maybe you're at a place in life and you've come this morning and, well, you're kind of looking for something. Let me say this to begin with. If you come and you're looking for something, I, will, I pray that by the end of this service, you'll understand that what you have come looking for is not a something, but is a someone. Uh, and it is a relationship with someone who is alive and well and resurrected uh, from the dead. I believe, in our, I believe in our Jesus so much that I believe no matter what condition you come in today, no matter how you come, no matter what your need, how great, big, small, far, or wide, I believe that our Lord is so able and so capable that He can meet that need in your life right here, right now, and fully satisfy you that you'll leave here walking in victory, living the resurrected life. Amen? Amen. Well, I, I believe that. And so, if you have come looking for something, I want to remind you that it's not something, but it's someone. And I don't mean someone is in a relationship in your life, your neighbor down the road, or, or maybe a child that's grown prodigal and your heart's longing to, to, to have that relationship and the need of that relationship. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a parent or maybe it's a friend or something. And, and what you have seen is, is you've seen God dis, dismantling that scaffolding around you and all of a sudden it seems like your life is crumbling. But you still don't need someone just any someone, you need Jesus. And either he is our all in all or he's nothing at all, amen? It's got to be one or the other. I mean, he's either fully sufficient or he leaves us in need and lacking and wanting and he's not enough. And I want you to know today that I believe he's fully sufficient. I believe today he's able to meet every single need in the deepest, innermost parts of our lives. And I believe that today because he's no longer on a cross, uh, but he's resurrected as he said he would. And today he's seated at the right hand of the Father where he ever lives to make intercession, to pray for you and I in our time of need. That's why he's given us the invitation several times in the 34th Psalm. But he's given us the invitation that we can come boldly into the throne of grace. Keep this in your mind. The throne room where we once were forbidden, where we once could not go, where we once were not qualified or welcome to go. He's now given us an invitation to go boldly into the throne room in our time of need and ask for help. And he is our help. And, and so as we think about that and we, and we process all of this, and I say he's alive. I, I want to give you some evidence today that he's alive. Because I think if you'll fully realize that we serve a risen Savior, we don't, we don't just serve a historical Jesus who came, lived, died, and so forth. But we serve a Jesus who came, lived, died, and he rose again. And today he's alive and he's present in Liberty Baptist Church. Very much alive and well. So I want to give you some evidences of the resurrection. I think if you can, if I, if the Spirit can convince you that the Lord is alive and He's here for you, then it'll let you leave here changed. And if I know there's one thing we all need today, I don't care how good you're doing or how, how much struggle you have, I don't care how good you are or how bad you are. If there's one thing we all need to leave here today with is we all need to leave here changed in some way. All for the better. Well, number one, one indisputable proof of the resurrection that Jesus is alive is the empty tomb. I want to remind you that that tomb was sealed 
with the mark of Pilate. That tomb was guarded by soldiers. Uh, and, and I want to remind you that as the angel offered evidence that Jesus is not here, there's no one could dispute that the body was not indeed still in the tomb. Now remember, if you're so against Jesus in such a way to where you will betray him, where you will, as religious leaders, you'll have him crucified. Go through false trials and mock trials and have him crucified. The last thing you want is that body to disappear. You're going to want to turn up a body. It's not in the Bible, but I'm sure uh, that uh, there was a search that took place because all of these Jewish leaders, the last thing they needed was a resurrected Savior. And they remember what he had said he would do. Uh, but the tomb was empty and nobody's ever been able through history to explain away the empty tomb. And that's because there's no explanation needed. He arose and he arose in victory on that third day. Number two, what about uh, the sudden change in, the, in these fearful disciples that emboldened them to go out and change the world? Now I want to remind you, after the crucifixion, the Bible says, or at the crucifixion, all but John, they all fled like sheep gone astray. Out of fear, I mean, come on. Uh, they have taken the one you followed for three years and crucified him. Uh, the, the, they're probably going to be looking for you next. You run a risk of being crucified by identifying yourself with Jesus. Uh, but, and so something happened on that Sunday morning that changed these fearful, coward disciples. All of them had fled him, remember? All but John. Something happened in the life of these disciples that now emboldened them and empowered them to become workers of Jesus Christ and preachers of the gospel. Now, we could say, well, one or two of them was crazy anyway. I mean, come on, they were fishermen by trade. You know they're crazy. Uh, and we could say they just lost their mind, but it wasn't just one. Listen, there was nine others there, and they all come out of hiding, if you will, because they had an upper room meeting with the resurrected Savior. Remember that? Where they went to the upper room and they gathered together and, and, and there they were when Jesus met with them on that Sunday night. And so something happened in the life of the disciples who had become cowards that caused them to come out of the shadows and become bold men. And I'll go ahead and say this right here about those 12 disciples or not 12, we know Judas went out and hung himself, so there's 11 left, but those 11, all but John. All but John, he died of old age. But those 10, 10 of them, 10 of them, they were eventually all martyred for their testimony of Jesus and his resurrection. Now let me ask you something. Would you be willing to die for a good cause? Now, I mean, let's think about it, and we, we can't really answer this honestly because we don't know until we're put in the position. Uh, but I mean, right here, right now, for a good cause, would you be willing to give your life and die today? And you don't have to answer that because we don't know how we'll answer that unless you're in that situation. Uh, and so it's very difficult, and I, I think some would and some wouldn't. That's just the way the ball rolls. But these men, if Jesus was not alive, then they died for a lie. And I don't know any man that's willing to be crucified and murdered today, executed today for a lie. Some might die for the truth and a good thing, but I don't know anybody that would die for a lie. Well, 10 of these disciples, they all die. And not just these 10, but keep in mind, for those centuries that follow, they were preachers of the gospel and disciples of Jesus, and they were martyred, terrible, terrible deaths, put to death. Because they preached a resurrected Savior, a resurrected Jesus. That's the difference Jesus made in the life of his people. What about the church? Think about this. In just a very fast and quick amount of time, the disciples went from those 10 and a few, and women and others, yes, to 120. To then he was seen of 500. Uh, and then there were the thousands on the day of Pentecost. Uh, and then so from Resurrection Sunday, the church began to emerge. And for some 2,000 years, the church has gathered all over the world in open countries and in closed countries and in free countries and in enslaved countries. There is the church of the living God that is thriving and alive and well today. Why? Is it because of a lie that we believe? No. 
It's because we serve a risen Savior and we believe to the core of our being that he's alive and as he left and said he would come back, he will one day part those eastern skies and come back on a cloud of glory for you and I, the church. So, so what about the church? How do you explain away the church the worldwide? Has the, and I'm talking about the true church, not this junky fake stuff and, and, and all that. A true church. How do you explain a church, this body of worldwide believers who have this same core value of beliefs that Jesus came, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died for my sins, rose again on that third day, and by through repentance and faith, I can have a relationship with him. How do you explain that away? I'm just trying to tell you he's alive today. And he's alive and well. My goodness, as we think about uh, these, uh, these proofs that, that Jesus is alive and we think about uh, the things like the inability of, uh, of the Jewish leaders to, to come up with a, an alternative explanation as to where Jesus went to. I mean, he was crucified on the cross. Roman soldiers who were trained in execution examined him to be sure that he was dead on the cross. Remember, they didn't have to break his legs because he had already given up his life. But they come around and took a spear and drove it in his heart. Water and blood rushed out to confirm the death of our Lord. So he was indeed dead, yes. I know there's this swoon theory that's out there that says he really didn't die, uh, that he was just placed in a cool tomb and it revived him and he got up and he walked away. But, oh my goodness, should we even spend time there today? Let's not waste our time when professional executioners crucified him. And he gave up his life and they confirmed the death. But if he, if he was alive, somebody needed to, if he was alive, somebody needed to testify. And so he showed himself to these disciples and he showed himself to those that, uh, that had faith in him and believed in him. And he made these post-resurrection appearances some 40 post-resurrection appearances in a period of 10 days just to let his people know, hey, I'm no longer dead, but I am a living Savior who's alive today. And he's Lord of all. He's Lord over death, hell, and the grave because of what he did on that Sunday morning. And so the Jewish leaders, they, they were under pressure to produce a body or to produce, uh, to produce something that resembled the body of the Lord. And they come up with nothing, nothing in defense of the resurrection, uh, or in defense of his, 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 the fact that he may be dead. What about in 300 years, Christianity spread around the world? Could a dead Savior do that? No, not at all. Could a Savior who's not alive but's buried and his bones are in a grave? Not at all. But a meeting with a... Now think what happened in the lives of these cowards, these men that run. A meeting with the resurrected Christ changed them and they left that place. They left Jerusalem. They went all directions across the globe and they changed the world with the testimony of Jesus Christ. And by the way, that's why you're saved today. It's because the meeting with the resurrected Jesus changed them. and They began to change the world around them through the power of God. They went to wherever they went to, across Asia Minor and into Europe. And as the gospel spread and it spread, it eventually made its way here. And, and somewhere down the line, somebody got saved and that individual witnessed and that individual preached and that individual became a disciple. And they spread the gospel and spread the gospel until you heard the gospel one day and responded to the testimony of Jesus. And so see, there's a Savior that's alive today. And what about the New Testament that you hold in your hands. Now keep in mind, those 27 books, they all line up written by different authors, 13 of them by the same man, Paul. Paul's life was changed, a murderer. Man, he persecuted the church. He was kicking open church doors, snatching believers up, taking them to be put to death and watch them and give permission as they were stoned. And one day on the Damascus Road, this vile sinner of a man who persecuted the church, he met a resurrected Savior, and it changed him, and he, and he then become a preacher of the gospel. Man, I mean, he got saved, and he got right, and the church kind of scared about it. 
I mean, they're like, look, we've heard Paul got saved and he's wanting to preach in our church, but we don't need to let him come in. He's the one that was murdering Christians. Like, what's he doing, faking us out? Is he trying to come in and play a game with us just so he could catch us? And thank God somebody spoke on his behalf and he was, they were able to listen to him and hear him. And three times over, he gave his testimony that this is who I was. I was a vile man. I've met every religious requirement of the day, but yet my insides were vile. But Jesus changed me when I met him on the Damascus Road one day. But, the, but 13 of those 27 New Testament books were written by Paul. But those New Testament books, all by different people, all from different backgrounds, and they all have a common theme, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he came, lived, died, and rose again for you and I. But that's not all. Those 27 books that all have the same theme... Do you understand this would be like us going across the United States and walking in restaurants this morning at breakfast and picking one man and say, I want you to write a book about something. Anything you want to write about, just write it. And go to another restaurant on the other side of the, the U.S. to another uh, a coastal town or whatever and walk in and pick a, another individual there and say, sir, I'd like you to write a book about anything that you want to write a book about. And then go to another uh, place uh, all the way up to the northern border, walk in a restaurant and find a man sitting there and say, sir, I'd like you to write a book about anything that you want to write about. Just write it. Do that 27 times or minus the 13, but do that that many times and then come back together and gather those books together and they've all wrote about the same exact thing. What is the odds of that happening? It could not happen with man, but God did that. That's how we know the Bible is true. And then the whole Bible, a span of 1,500 years, written by some 40 authors, or some 66 different books and some 40 authors. Watch this. But those New Testament books that are about the gospel of Jesus, they correspond to and they shed light and they back up what's been foreshadowed in all of those Old Testament books. It's all in alignment from Genesis to Revelation. How else could that happen unless... There was a Savior who came from glory and was born in an old rugged manger and made his way to an old rugged cross and walked out of a borrowed tomb on Sunday morning. He's alive today, and I'm telling you, there's proof that he's alive. So where, where does that bring us? We could go on and on with this. I would love just to spend an hour telling you about all the martyrs that died for the testimony of Jesus, lived their life spreading the gospel and were thrown to wild beasts to be murdered and killed. History bears record of this. Were pulled apart by wild horses. Had their head, had, were beheaded. Were hung upside down and crucified. Many, and were covered in, in hot tar. And set on fire to burn. Lighting up the garden of some of the Roman emperors. Burning Christians. I would like to tell you about that. But would people do that for a lie? No. No, but for a truth they believed inside of them with all of their being. And for a truth, for the truth that they knew that Jesus was alive and as he had been crucified and lives, that they may die in this physical body, but they will live forever with the Lord. So they give up their lives. So listen just a moment. Girls, you can come to the piano. What's that have to do with anything, preacher? Well, I'll tell you what it has to do with anything is this. You've come today and you have that need. I don't know what it is. But you keep coming and you keep coming and you keep thinking you're looking for something. You're looking for something. You need more. You need more. There's something missing in your heart. There's something missing in your life. And I want to tell you what it is today. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Maybe you know him as your Lord and Savior. I understand that. But yet still every day you just wake up and have this great need going on right now. Maybe you're the one who you're, the scaffolding of your life's been falling down all around you and you're left wanting and wondering, Lord, why am I so broken? Why am I so messed up? Why, why do I just have this deep needed craving inside of me for something else that's out there? And I don't know what it is. I've tried things. I've tried possessions. I, I've tried hobbies. I've, I've tried relationships and people, but still yet at the end of the day, I'm still left longing and I want more. 
And I pity those people who are looking for fulfillment and satisfaction and fullness in things and pleasures and hobbies. It's to spend money and money and more money and buy new things and, and go new places and, 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 you know, mark stuff off the bucket list only to find at the end of the day that that same need's still in their life. I want to tell you what you need. You need to meet a resurrected Savior. Let Him change your life. You don't know the story of everybody sitting around you in here, but I promise you this, there's some lives sitting here that are so changed and so different because they met Jesus one day. Not just one day, one time, but they walk with him every day. He's alive and well in their life. The church preached that over and over. Those disciples, they went about preaching that, hey, we've got a Savior that's alive and he lives inside of us and he's living in the church. And that's what I'm trying to tell you today. Whatever, however you come today, what you truly need. You, and here's the thing. You may think you know what you need, but I'm going to tell you from my personal experience, when I thought what I needed, that I was usually wrong. And I'm going to just say, you're probably wrong today. What you really need is, is you need a, res, a relationship with a living Savior. Let Him be your guide. Let Him be your companion let him prove himself to be a friend to you that sticks closer than a brother. Let him love you like you need to be loved. Let him love you like you want to be loved. Let him provide his affectionate care, his compassion. Let him be that good shepherd who takes you like a dear, dear weak sheep and just embraces you in his love and in his mercies. I thought as I was thinking about this today, I could tell you about my own life and how that... Meeting Jesus one day changed me. See, I thought I was saved when I was a little boy, but I, but I didn't, and I learned years later that I was not saved as a little boy because it never changed my life. Not as a little boy, not as a young man, not as a teenager. My life was never changed. But one day I did meet Jesus, and it changed me. And he's still changing me, thank God. I thought about a friend of mine. One of the most dearest friends I've ever had. How that he may smile and cut up and be the funniest guy you've ever been around. If you just meet him and talk with him for a few minutes. But, but I knew him. And I knew that in his childhood, as a young boy, that his daddy abandoned him. And so the big, his big brother took on the role of daddy so he grew close to that brother and then that brother one night at a riverside party on a sandbar swam out in the river and drowned and got carried down the river he lost his brother and then life brought him some other blows a son that was sick terribly critically born sick and remained that way till he died when he was 8 or 10 years old and I knew that this man, he was bitter on the inside. And he was terribly angry on the inside. He would smile at you and laugh with you and cut up, yes. And he could sing like Elvis. And he was a mad, angry man. And he'd become a fighter as a result of that. Everywhere he went, he just he fought. And he liked to fight. And he wanted to fight. He was just hoping that you crossed his path the wrong way one day so he could he'd put a hurting on you. Because he had all this bitterness and all this anger inside of him. <laughs> I met Jesus one day myself and I told him about it. So he calls me late one night and he says, can you meet me in the plaza? I said, yeah, I'll be there. Pulled up beside him and this hard, hard man, tough man, he said, I don't know what you've got, but he said, I want some of it. <laughs> I didn't know I had anything. I just, I got Jesus. And I shared Jesus with him. And the next day about lunch, 
in a yard in a place called the Old Ash Settlement of the West, West, uh, Webster community. He got on his knees and gave his life to Jesus. After that, he, he started drawing. He's an artist. Drew me a big church. Put a wonderful little poem with it. And he would listen to gospel music because he picked a little and he would record gospel songs and, and give to me on cassette tapes back then. He didn't just email somebody one or text, but he'd give it to me on cassette tapes. And he'd become a different man, altogether different. Could a psychologist bring that change in a man like that? I don't think so. Could a medical doctor bring a change like that with proper medications in a man like that? I don't think so. Could self-reform bring change in a man like that? I, I, I think not. But what changed this man was he met Jesus one day. Now listen to me. On that Sunday morning, the Lord sent a messenger to tell those disciples, those women, and his disciples, I've gone on before you, and if you'll come to me, I'm going to meet you there. And sure enough, they did. And he met them there, and there, when they first saw him, here's what he was doing. He had prepared a meal for them and was ready to feed their hunger because he knew they'd been out all night. I don't think I'm stretching it when I say this, but wouldn't it be a thing this morning if you come here and you've got some kind of hunger gnawing at you deep inside you, wouldn't it be a thing this morning if a man named Jesus just come on before you got here today and he's prepared a meal for you because he knows that you're hungry and you need to be fed? Wouldn't it be something to eat this morning from a meal that's been prepared by the master himself? to feast upon something that a living Jesus has touched, made, and prepared so that you don't have to leave hungry with a gnawing need in your life, but so that you'll leave full today living the resurrected life because you've been in fellowship and been fed by the Master. Wouldn't it be a thing this morning if that was me? Wouldn't it be a thing this morning if that was you? And we as the people of God who have put our faith to save us in a res in, to, has put our faith to save us in a resurrected Savior would put our faith in a living Savior to give us life abundant and resurrection life in this life. Is that you today? Or is that you? You on the left, you on the right, and you in the middle. I believe he brought us together today and God's got something he wants to do here and now. Not for your neighbor, not for the person beside you or behind you, but he brought you here for you so that he could feed you and satisfy those cravings within you. I want to ask you to stand, and as soon as you stand, you make your way, and girls, you sing. Stand and step out right now and come quickly. Quickly come. Quickly come.